Well, welcome everybody. Good evening. And um, welcome to our sixth national gathering of Acting for Justice While Sheltering in Place. Tonight, we're going to continue the conversation about racism, and we thank all of you for joining us in this, what I think is a very important project. This seems to be a critical moment in human history when a shift in consciousness among white people and the prospect of a more just world seem within our grasp. There are conversations being had that have not been had, at least by white people, at least not in the United States. There are voices in business and government, entertainment, sports, and academia that are speaking out in ways that suggest a genuine movement. And tonight, we simply want to participate in that movement. So we're very glad that you're here. And I invite all of you to join me in an opening prayer. God of justice, in your wisdom, you create all people, all people in your image without exception. Through your goodness, open our eyes to see the dignity, beauty, and worth of every human being. Open our minds to understand that all your children are sisters and brothers of the same human family. Open our hearts to repent of racist attitudes, behaviors, and speech which demean others. Open our ears to hear the cries of those wounded by racial discrimination and their passionate appeals for change. Strengthen our resolve to make amends for past injustices and to right the wrongs of history. And fill us with courage that we might seek to heal wounds, build bridges, forgive and be forgiven and establish peace and equality for all in our faith communities. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. And it's my pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker, Dr. Vicki Vernon Lott. She's a member, I'm happy to say, of the Just Faith Ministries Board of Directors. She's a cradle Catholic, co-chair of the Social Justice Ministry at Holy Cross Catholic Church in Austin, Texas. She's one of 14 children, grew up in Milwaukee where she attended Catholic schools. Her dad, Ken Vernon, was the first black deacon of the Milwaukee Archdiocese. And her cousin, the late Leonard Olivier, was auxiliary bishop of Washington, DC. Vicki received her bachelor's degree from St. Norbert, College in Green Bay and her master's and doctorate degrees from LSU. She taught high school music and English and then had a 32-year career in higher education administration working at five historically black colleges and universities in Louisiana, Virginia, Tennessee, Mississippi, and Texas. She currently works as associate racial equity consultant for Joyce James Consulting and is a certified facilitator of racial sobriety with Father Clarence Williams. She's on the national board of Pax Christi USA and is a member of the Pax Christi anti-racist team. Her son, Joe, is a professor at the University of Washington in Seattle. His wife, Joy, is dean of the graduate school there, and they have two sons who also happen to be Vicky's grandsons, eight and 10 year old, Jabari and Jordan. So welcome, Vicki, the microphone is all yours. Thank you so much, uh, Jack. Just a, a funny story about uh, when Joe and Joy were expecting uh, their second child. Joy asked a friend, uh, what did she think about a name if the name should, uh, if she should give this, this you know, uh, child in her, in her womb, uh, first name that started with the letter um, other than J, um, because, well, she said she thought that um, she didn't want to give him a, a, a name with the letter other than J because she didn't want him to feel out of place with everybody else in the family with J's. And then she said, but on the other hand, we all know families where everybody in the family's name starts with the first letter, and that sounds kind of corny. And so a friend of her, her friend said back to her, she said, well, when Joe and Joy named their first child Jabari, you already joined that club. <laughs> 
So, so they named the, the, the second child Jordan. Uh, they say it's for the Jordan River, not Michael Jordan. <laughs> anyway, uh, let me share my screen and get started. Okay, well, thanks again, Jack. And thank you so much for having me. So it's, it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, at, just, at Just Faith Ministries, we turn to our faith in so many instances for knowledge, for inspiration, for wisdom, for validation. We turn to our faith as a source of comfort. For me, in these past weeks and months, I've had to remind myself time and time again uh, to intentionally draw on the strength of my faith-based roots in order to not lose my equilibrium and my inner peace. Uh, but it's been tough. All of the headline news, news about injustices against black people and the related trauma and turmoil has, in uh, what many in the media call, uh, have ripped the band-aid off the wound of systemic racism that has existed in this country since 1619. So how can our faith be that bomb in Gilead to heal America's original sin of racism? Well, St. James gives us a clue. The second chapter of St. James, the first verse, he says, dear, uh, my dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? Now, before we look at what, what comes next in that passage, uh, where James talks about the poor and the concept of mercy, I want us to sit with this verse uh, just a little bit longer in the context of Richard Rohr from the Center for Action and Contemplation. His daily meditation on May 24th was entitled, Invitation to Solidarity. And in it, he talks about the oppressed being the outcasts of society. He reminds us that systemic oppression has been with us since ancient times and that the Bible is written from the perspective of the oppressed. We see in the gospels that the lame, the blind, the lepers, the prostitutes, the drunkards uh, tended to follow Jesus. And Jesus lived in close proximity to them or in solidarity with those on the outskirts of society. Those on the inside, the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, those who had privilege and comfort and luxury, uh, you know, and those at the center of power were the ones who crucified him. Rohr says, quote, the Bible reveals a liberating path of humility, compassion, and nonviolence in the face of oppression that culminates in the life, ministry, and state-sponsored execution of Jesus Yet we still honor people in power and shun the oppressed. Uh, Rohr ends the meditation by making the point that Christians were the oppressed minorities for the first 300 years after Jesus' death, but by the year 400 in the Common Era, Christians moved from, quote-unquote, hiding in the catacombs to presiding in the basilicas. When Christians gained power and privilege, they began to reinterpret the Bible by ignoring passages like the Sermon on the Mount that says, blessed are the poor in spirit, the meek, the merciful, the peacemakers, and those persecuted for righteousness. Instead, Christians became drunk with power and found ways to rationalize oppression in the name of God. We'll look at a couple of examples, but first, let's go back to St. James's warning. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but say to the poor one, you can stand over there or sit on the floor. Well, 
Doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? Listen to me, brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you dishonor the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? So whatever you say or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. So St. James talks about the poor in this passage, and he doesn't mention race, uh, but if we apply his words to today, of course, there are poor people of all races in this country. But as we see here, in 2015, the poverty rate for African Americans, or African American children, was triple that of white children. Now there's some other barometers, like uh, the wealth gap, and the income gap, but I, I chose this one because it's, it's, it's clear for the screen. Um, and, and we know that the gap has widened since then. So going back to the founding of this country, we also know that the slaves were poor and that they were dishonored and oppressed without mercy. Slave owners were so intent on keeping slave oppressed they feared they, that if they learned to read even certain passages of the Bible, like Moses telling Pharaoh to let his people go, that the slaves might rebel. So they published what was called a slave Bible that only included about 10% of the Old Testament and only about half of the New Testament. References to freedom were gone. For example, the whole book of Galatians was omitted which says, you know, there's neither slave nor free, we're all one in God's sight. This heavily redacted Bible kept passages about obedience and submissiveness. The passage that we just read from St. James was omitted. In, in this Bible, James goes from chapter two, uh, I'm sorry, skips from chapter one to chapter three. Chapter two, which we just read, is omitted. So this is an example of faith intersecting race and having an adverse effect. St. James also talks about having mercy. Uh, you may have read the book, Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson, or seen the movie, Just Mercy, that came out this past December, starring Michael B. Jordan as Attorney Stevenson and Jamie Foxx as Walter McMillan. Mercy, in this context, alludes to the death penalty, which, disproportionately affects African-American men. In this true story, Mr. McMillan was freed after serving six years on death row for a crime he didn't commit. He was convicted of killing a white woman based on the false testimony of one white man. A data compiled by the Equal Justice Initiative that was founded by Attorney Stevenson shows that nearly one out of nine death row inmates are ultimately found innocent. Where is the justice and mercy in the death penalty? No mercy was shown to George Stinney, a 14-year-old child who was accused of killing two white girls in 1944 near Columbia, South Carolina. Stinney was convicted by an all-white jury in less than 10 minutes. The court refused to hear his appeal. He was executed that same year, still at age 14, the youngest person executed in this country. And he was executed by electric chair. In 2013, his family petitioned for a new trial and his conviction was overturned 70 years later in 2014. The judge ruled that he had not been given a fair trial. He had no effective defense representation and the Sixth Amendment rights had been violated. She ruled that his confession was likely coerced and therefore inadmissible. She also found that the execution of a 14-year-old constituted cruel and unusual punishment. No mercy. <laughs> 
So I was emotional in preparing these last two slides because I'm a mother and a grandmother. And I see my son in Walter McMillan. And I think about the incident this past May when things could have turned out differently for Christian Cooper when Amy Cooper called the police and tried to frame him while he was bird watching in Central Park. I see my grandsons in George Stinney. And I think about the exonerated five, you know, formerly called the Central Park Five, who spent years in jail after also being falsely accused of murdering a white woman. Um, I have avoided talking about George Stinney in past presentations because of the emotion. And I thought about not including it here, but then I thought about my mantra from Luke 12, 48, to whom much has been given, much will be expected. So I knew I had to work through my own emotions and dig deep into my faith-based roots and tell the story from my perspective. I also often think about the fact that whatever I experience in preparing or facilitating a workshop and whatever I encounter in my daily life in terms of microaggressions or macroaggressions is minuscule compared with what my ancestors endured. Uh, this photo popped up when I Googled slave woman. Uh, I see in this photo sadness and despair, while at the same time, hope and maybe, you know, longing to be free, faith. Uh, we tend to think that slavery was so long ago until we really think about the timeline. This is my paternal grandmother, B.D. Vernon. Her grandfather was a slave. So your grandma was born in 1900, so her grandfather was born approximately, let's say, 1880. I, I, we don't, I don't know the dates. And so uh, just say 20 years. And her, her grandfather would have been born around 1860, clearly before slavery had ended. And when we were young, uh, grandma used to tell us about her grandfather and that um, he had, her grandfather had told her that he remembered being a slave and that he remembered the ending of slavery, and that when slavery ended, uh, he was just big enough to carry water. So this is not my great-great-grandfather, but I've had an image like this of him in my head since I was a little girl. So when I want to have a private pity party because doing anti-racist work is hard, I think of him, and that helps me to keep the faith. Here's another way to look at the timeline. 246 years of slavery from 1619 to 1865. Then 89 years of legalized segregation that included new ways of dehumanization of blacks through Jim Crow laws, medical exploitation, KKK terrorization and traumatization, and so much more. This graph shows that the civil rights movement started in 1954, only 66 years ago, compared to the previous 335 years of legal mistreatment of blacks. And we know that lynching continued well into the 1960s. Then in 2020, we had the murder of George Floyd, the officer's knee on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Truly a modern lynching. My parents were born in 1928, in the era of cross burnings and legalized lynchings. Although they grew up in Milwaukee, they faced many instances of overt and covert racism. For example, the schools were segregated, and even though there were no signs in the North saying no Negroes allowed, they knew that they wouldn't be served in certain restaurants. Even more recently, one of my in-laws uh, was adopted as an infant by a white family in Illinois. When they brought her home from the hospital, they found a cross had been burned in their yard. That was in 1970. So this Christian symbol of the cross to intimidate and threaten African Americans is another stark example of an abused intersectionality of faith and race. Lynchings were often held on Sunday mornings in broad daylight when spectators would leave church and watch a hanging. Notice that the gentleman on the far left seems to be laughing. 
another disconnect of the intersectionality between faith and race. They would leave the lynching and go back to church. Earlier, Frederick Douglass had said, I love the peaceable and impartial Christianity of Christ. I therefore hate the corrupt, slaveholding, women whipping, cradle plundering, partial and hypocritical Christianity of this land. Much of the corruption and hypocrisy of Christianity is fueled by a view that white people wanted to maintain power and wealth and that they were superior to all other peoples. In his 2011 book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, James Cone says that the Christian faith needed to look at the Gospels in a way that would not require them to acknowledge white supremacy as America's greatest sin. So they separated slavery, segregation, lynching, and violence against black people from their faith. They intentionally turned a blind eye or in denial and were complicit in seeing blacks as less than human. That way, they could feel comfortable in their distortion of Christianity. And unfortunately, that mindset persists in many today. In a congressional hearing, George Floyd's brother said that this country wouldn't allow an animal to be treated the way his brother was. Now, I don't know if this officer professes to have faith, but let's say, let's assume for purposes of this discussion that he doesn't. Well, what about fundamental respect for human dignity and human life? Basic ethical values supported internationally by the Geneva Convention state that even prisoners of war must be uh, treated humanely. So, but let's suppose the officer had seen Mr. Floyd as his brother or his cousin or his uncle. Just a point to ponder. Another reason Christians can justify such violence and hatred against blacks is the hypocrisy of depicting Jesus as white. Jesus most often appears in photos and portraits, statues, and even in the media as white, even though we know he was from the Middle East. I've seen these depictions millions of times. But Revelation 1, verses 14 and 15, says that his hair was like wool and his feet were like polished bronze. In 2001, the retired medical artist Richard Neff led a team of Israeli and British forensic anthropologists and computer programmers in creating a new image of Jesus based on an Israeli skull dating back to the first century AD. He used computer modeling like forensic scientists use and their knowledge of what Jewish people looked like at that time. So no one, no one claims that this reconstruction is exactly what Jesus looked like, but scholars believe that this image, about five feet tall, with darker skin, dark eyes, and shorter, curlier hair, is more accurate than many artistic depictions. And I, I put the link there to, uh, you know, for reference to the research that was done. Uh, but almost all scholars agree that Jewish Galileans 2,000 years ago probably didn't have blue eyes and blonde hair. If Jesus were walking around the U.S. today in human form, probably looking like the slide we just saw, he would be subject to racial profiling, mass incarceration, and police brutality. In this chart, if we do the math, we see that black and brown people are 25% of the population and 76% of those fatally shot by police since 2015. So the young Jesus could easily have been Emmett Till, or George Stinney, or Tamir Rice. And if he made it to adulthood, he could have had the same fate as Eric Garner, or Michael Brown, or George Floyd, or so many others. So we've been talking about the intersectionality of faith and race from a spiritual perspective. 
In the secular world, the words faith and trust are often used interchangeably by grammarians and linguists. And I want to say just a word about trust and race as it relates to the healthcare industry. Uh, in this era of COVID-19, we've been hearing so much about African Americans being more susceptible to the disease because of their disproportionately poor health. But why is that? So we know about food deserts in low-income neighborhoods. We know about cramped living spaces uh, with probably an essential worker as the primary breadwinner, uh, lack of health insurance. Uh, combined with intergenerational racial trauma, and all, this, all these things have adverse effects on mental and physical health. The way that health and wellness intersects with faith and race is a long and complex story that must also include economic injustice. But that's a whole separate webinar by itself, which would also take a deep dive into both historical and recent uh, contributing factors as to why many in the black community mistrust the healthcare industry in general and white male doctors in particular. Uh, just briefly, uh, much of the lack of trust stems from what Harriet Washington calls medical apartheid, the dark history of medical experimentation on black Americans from colonial times to the present. And that, that title really summarizes it all. But Dr. Washington uses disturbing detail to describe the gruesome reality of the violent ways that physicians forcibly restrain slave women without anesthesia. And then, without anesthesia, while the women were shrieking in agony, they performed unconscionable procedures, such as slicing and suturing their genitalia in the name of medical research and gynecology. That's just one example. A common thread throughout the book is that white people thought that the slaves were subhuman and didn't feel pain. Physicians forcibly subjected slaves to unimaginable suffering and cruelty, which they then proudly documented in their medical journals. Fast forwarding to 1965, we see here the political activist Fannie Lou Hamer. She had been subjective to what was called the quote unquote Mississippi appendectomy or non-consensual sterilization. She said that that experience led to her political awakening. So uh, I wanna move on now by anticipating one of your questions. I was on the webinar a few weeks ago with the Reverend Dr. Lewis Brogdon, and when we got to the Q&A section, Jack said that many participants asked, well, what can I do? The list is limitless, but here are 12 things that I thought about. Number one, first and foremost, do your homework. Learn the true history of race in America. Don't rely on black people to teach you. You know, some black people will. But don't be surprised if many in your workplace, church, or other organizations are too emotionally and physically exhausted from everything going on in their lives. There are more than enough articles, books, blogs, movies, videos that you can read or watch on your own. For starters, I have a resource list that uh, I'll share with Leela. Number two, develop real relationships with people of color. I can't count the number of stories I've heard about white people initiating a conversation with the black person about race that backfired. They, they knew that person from passing in the hallway or even had a working relationship as a colleague, you know, a supervisor or a supervisee, but not uh, really friends. Race is an uncomfortable subject to talk about. So having a personal relationship uh, as a prerequisite is the ideal. It's not absolutely necessary, but... Uh, if, it's, if you don't have it, don't be surprised if it backfires. So start by getting to know them uh, in general. You know, for icebreakers, talk about things that you have in common, your children, your hobbies, your favorite foods, the weather, anything that you have in common. In a pre-COVID debrief session that I co-facilitated at a large organization, 
uh, a white woman admitted that after our workshop, she and some colleagues realized that only white people ate in the lunchroom. So they reached out and invited people of color to join them for lunch, and they developed more personal relationships. And then they progressed to having courageous conversations about race. Number three, listen. Once you develop that relationship, or if you already have friends outside of your race, listen. And don't listen to debate. Listen actively with an open mind to absorb and understand, and then, you know, to follow up with reflection. You know, if we scramble the letters of the word listen, what word do we get? Silent. If you want to respond at all, think about what you would say if someone told you about the loss of a loved one or some other tragic event. You know, I'm sorry that happened to you, period. Number four, talk about race. After you've done your homework, talk about race, but through your own new lens of heightened awareness. Talk with your children and your grandchildren about the human dignity of all people, people of color in particular. So Jack um, published uh, a piece uh, for Father's Day that was really beautiful and uh, it's worth reading for those of you who haven't read it or rereading for those of you who have. And so I've asked Jack to you know, send that out as an attachment as well. And he said he will. <laughs> Uh, so outside of your home, you can, you can call out racist jokes or racist statements from your coworkers. Uh, in another workshop that I uh, co-facilitated, a white person told us, and all of the other white people in the room agreed, that in one-on-one -on -one conversations with other whites or in groups where they're only whites, no, no people of color in the room, that they hear many racist statements every day. One example was uh, a woman shared with us that she moved into an upscale neighborhood that had a clubhouse and a swimming pool and uh, a neighbor came over to welcome her and said, this is a great neighborhood. Not many black people go to the pool. So, uh, you know, these are instances when you can speak up and let people know how offended you are. In this case, uh, you know, this, uh, this lady said that she asked her neighbor, you know, well, what, what makes you think you can talk to me like that? Number five, tell the truth. As you widen your racial equity lens, be sure to tell the truth about the new things you've heard and learned. Tell the truth to your family, friends, colleagues, enemies, frenemies. Uh, and sometimes that's hard. Uh, you know, it requires unlearning some things that like we learned, you know, I learned that Christopher Columbus discovered America. You know, we need to admit that he isn't the hero that we thought he was. That requires vulnerability and letting go of our egocentric default position. You know, our tendency is to say, well, I believe that because I've always believed it you know, without looking deeper into whether it's true or not. Telling the truth requires letting go of some things we learned at home, some things we learned at school, and even some things we may have learned at church. Number six, accept other people's truth. My truth may not be your truth, but it doesn't make it any less true. My lived experiences are different from your lived experiences. You may see the police as people that you call to help you when you're in trouble. And the last weeks have shown clearly why many blacks don't see the police as people who will help them. But, but don't try to speak for black people. As University of Michigan professor Suad Abdul Kabir said, you don't have to be the voice of the voiceless, just pass the mic. Number seven, See the Bible from your new lens, from the vantage point of Jesus being in solidarity with the outcasts and the oppressed of society. If, if we can envision Jesus not with Eurocentric features, but as the way he's described in Revelation with hair of wool and feet like polished bronze, 
Uh, even though Jesus was feared for his message and not for his looks, we can connect the dots to black people in the U.S. today who are feared for their looks and better imagine how Jesus was viewed as a threat to those who had power and privilege. You know, some theologians believe that one reason Jesus spoke in parables so often was so that before the appointed hour in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, he didn't want to further infuriate those in power who wanted him dead. Number eight, see racism as a pro-life issue. In his statement on the death of George Floyd, Pope Francis said that U.S. Catholics are obsessed with abortion as a pro-life issue, but racism is an important issue as well. Uh, and there's a link to that article. So you can be persistent in encouraging and even challenging the pro-life ministry in your circles to expand their lens. Pro-lifers' silence on racism is complicity. Number nine, encourage sermons that address racism. If your pastor is not addressing racism, racism from the pulpit, ask why not. I'm fortunate that my pastor regularly does. Uh, we have participants from other churches who attend Courageous Conversations that my parish hosts who have said that their pastors avoid the topic for two primary reasons. One, they feel ill-equipped or underprepared. And two, they don't want to alienate their donors. So well, one solution for the lack of preparation about racial justice is to encourage them to take the Just Faith Ministries Racial Justice Series. It's a great preparation. And once they've completed the series, we pray that the Spirit will have strengthened them to do what's right and preach about the sin of racism in spite of what the donors might think. Another approach is to encourage your pastor um, by you're taking the lead in getting together a number of like-minded parishioners and approach them as a group, you know, either directly or through your bishop. Number 10, work against voter suppression. Use whatever influence you have with your city, county, or state officials and others willing to help uh, and work to A, restore voting rights to the formerly incarcerated, B, promote mail-in balloting, C, get involved in voter registration, D, propose ways to keep more polling places open, and E, take someone who doesn't have transportation to the polls. For example, on that last one, uh, in the Georgia primary election a few weeks ago, one polling place, according to the news, in inner city Atlanta, had a line three, box, three blocks long, while a polling place in an affluent suburb had no line. So taking people to vote in November doesn't require any influence, just that you have a vehicle and a mask, and maybe a few extra masks if you have, if you have passengers, for, for the passengers who may not have one. Number 11, work, work to close the academic achievement gap. A first step here could be to work to decriminalize student behavior in the education system. In other words, statistics show overwhelmingly that when blacks and whites are accused of the same offense, like for example, if, if Leela and I get in a fight, um, she would have little or no consequences and I would be suspended. So suspension leads to expulsion, expulsion leads to juvenile detention, Detention leads to adult prison. That's the school to prison pipeline, and it's a real street. It starts in pre-K. Dismantling the school to prison pipeline is a huge step in closing the achievement gap because obviously students can't learn if they're not in school. Uh, you can do your part with greater awareness and by promoting fairness in the school system in your community. And number 12, <clears throat> You can work to transform the criminal justice system. Now, this is a complex issue with many tangents. For example, homelessness is criminalized. Uh, you can be a part of decriminalizing homelessness by working to provide affordable housing or eliminating discrimination in home loans. Other ways you can be involved with improving the criminal justice system is working to abolish the death penalty, 
and transforming incarceration laws and practices. There are thousands of people in jails across the country who have not yet even been charged with a crime. There are people who are incarcerated for misdemeanors and nonviolent crimes who are unable to make bail. There are people in jail for failure to pay child support. That's the uh, you know, archaic debtor's prison concept. People in jail for mental illness and drug addiction. You know, those, they, need to, they need treatment, not jail. So these arrests are also tied to what some say uh, is the need to defund the police, which in my opinion really means reallocation of resources so that when a call comes into 911 about a homeless or mentally ill person, for example, a social worker or healthcare professional is dispatched and not the police. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. All of our other social systems need transformation too, including healthcare, employment, transportation, and child welfare. There's environmental racism, uh, which is a reality where anything with toxic emission is placed in a poor and oppressed neighborhood. But I'll, I'll stop here and anticipate your next question. Where do I start or how do I start? A prerequisite before you start is to acknowledge and really understand that racism has been in place for over 400 years, COVID-1619, and we can't undo it overnight. It's a process that takes time. I have two suggestions. A great place to start is with expanding your racial equity lens. We already mentioned doing your homework. But one way to improve your awareness and understanding is participating in the Just Faith Ministries modules on race. I was honored to have served as a consultant in the development of uh, this series of three eight-week modules. And I suggest that you start with the first module, Faith and Racial Equity, because it's a great foundation. Module two, Faith and Racial Healing, and module three, Faith and Racial Justice, build on the first one. Uh, in addition to encouraging your clergy to participate, it's a wonderful program for everyone, wherever you are on your journey. It's kind of a little bit unrelatedly. I recently listened to a racial justice webinar featuring my homeboy from Milwaukee, the Reverend Dr. Brian Massengill of, of Fordham University, who wrote the book Racial Justice and the Catholic Church. And in the Q&A, uh, someone made the observation that his presentation seemed like a graduate seminar, and the person asking the question said that he saw himself uh, at the middle school level in terms of his racial awareness. Uh, but we designed the Just Faith Ministry modules for you to feel very comfortable starting with the faith and racial, uh, with faith and racial equity, uh, and to be able to go with the flow without feeling overwhelmed wherever you are along your journey. And even though I've been doing anti-racist work for more than 20 years, I learned new facts while researching suggestions to include in the program, and I discovered deeper perspectives and reinforced things that I had heard before. For me, the most important thing was that it helped my continuing journey of spiritual growth, and that strengthened my ability to be able to talk about race. It's a process, and I'm still on that journey. Uh, these modules will inspire you and guide you in developing a roadmap to go forward from there. The next step, and my last point, uh, after taking the racial justice modules, or if you decide to not take them, uh, is to develop your, your first step then would be to develop your own strategic plan. This may be the most challenging, and it should require some deep reflection, some truth telling for sure, vulnerability, and perseverance. Your plan should be tailored to your specific community. It's not one size fits all. Take some time to look at the macro picture or the bird's eye view of areas where your community needs to improve. It may be all of the things we talked about today. But, so then decide where are the quick wins for yourself in terms of your individual growth and with like-minded believers for your church or community. What may we be already doing that we can tweak to achieve some short-term goals? I like to think of a jigsaw puzzle. 
when we dump the pieces at first, it seems overwhelming. But we have the box top as a guide, uh, and then we see two pieces that fit, maybe 10 pieces, and work on those first. So develop your own strategy based on what James Baldwin said. What did James Baldwin say? Every white person in this country, no, no matter what he or she says, they know they would not like to be a black person. If they know that, they know everything else they need to know. And whatever else they may say is a lie. He made those comments at, uh, uh, during a speech at UC Berkeley in 1979. So white people, ask yourselves, why would you not want to be a black person? Suppose the script were flipped and white people were oppressed. How would you want your employer to treat you? What would you want your children to learn in history class? How would you want the police department to operate? What would you want your church to say or do about the injustices that you face every day in every venue? What would you change for yourself and your family in all areas of your life? So write down your answers. And that's another way to start putting that jigsaw puzzle together or developing your blueprint or action plan. And finally, one of my favorite quotes of all times from Martin Luther King, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. Today we have so many people who are unaware or in denial about racism. Only light can drive out that darkness. Also, we see so much racial bitterness and hatred, which only worsens when we respond with more hatred. We need love to undo that. The Bible mentions light 272 times and love 310 times. So we have a roadmap for the successful intersectionality of faith and race by bringing light to darkness and where there's hatred, sowing love. Amen. Vicki, thank you so much. Um, we have a few questions, uh, and um, I'm kind of um, melding a couple of them together in this question. This really has to do with uh, effectiveness, I think. The question in so many words is, um, as a white person, um, how do I effectively, I think with an emphasis on effectively, confront my white colleagues when I hear them speaking racist comments? So again, I think the question here is, I've got the courage, but I'm not sure I have the skill. How do I do that effectively? I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean, that's really a question for another white person, but let me, let me take, a, take a stab at it. I, um, I, I mean, I think any time you're, you're having a discussion with, with someone where you're at odds is to see, is there some kind of common ground? Where, you know, what do you agree on? What, what's an entree to say, you know, uh, um, this is um, something positive that you said, or this is something positive about you, but um, how can we... Um, Consider something else that's beyond what you uh, what you've always thought. You know, it's a matter of 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 stretching, and 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 the the person has to be open minded. If the person is closed minded, then you know, unfortunately, there's a, there's a place in the Bible I don't remember where it is where um, Jesus said, when you go into a town and if they accept you to um to go in and if and if uh if they if they reject you then um wipe the dust from your shoes and and, and keep stepping to the next person that you know that that may be or uh you know another option might be if you have a uh, a mediator you know someone that is um you know knows both of you to maybe kind of mediate that but uh yeah that that's that's a question and when you get in 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 um in groups with all white people, ask, ask them that question. And I'd, I'd like to know what their, your responses are there as well. 
Fabulous. In fact, uh, let me invite to those of you who are on the call right now, if any of you have had an experience of effectively communicating with another white person who's just made a racist comment, please put that in the comment section or put it in the chat section and send it to Leela or me. We'd be glad to collect those and include it in whatever we receive with the email that we'll follow up with uh, tomorrow. Um, the other question that um, I got, Vicki, was um, have you yourself um, seen where a predominantly or maybe exclusively white church actually made some very positive steps in um, educating themselves and beginning to address issues of race? In other words, a lot of the people on this call tonight are, are members of all white or almost all white communities and feel a little bit um, daunted by the, by, the, by the task at hand. So can you tell a story of, of a, a sort of a success story that you've actually witnessed or know of? Oh, yeah, sure. Right here in Austin, Texas, where um, you know, the church that I attend is uh, predominantly African-American, the only uh, quote-unquote black Catholic church in Austin. And we started doing Courageous Conversations, what, five years ago now, almost every month after um, the death of uh, Michael, after Ferguson, because uh, we weren't hearing uh, anything from the pulpit about um, racism, except from, from my pastor. And so we started having courageous conversations. And most of the people who come are from white churches. And they have, um, you know, we, we started slowly, you know, building and, and uh, discussing and, and looking at, at films. And, uh, you know, it's, it's grown from there. So, uh, there, yeah, it's, it's, it's doing well in a number of, of pre all white parishes, predominantly white parishes in, in Austin. Uh, I'm just looking at the last uh, note sent uh, to me. This sounds like gross self-promotion, but uh, I'll go ahead and share it with everybody. Thank you to Just Faith Ministries for the racial justice modules. We did the faith and racial equity program in January and February, and miracles are happening in our faith community and creating a roadmap as a faith community. And I just want to underscore the point, and Vicki's made it very well, that um, education is just so powerful. I think it was uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who said, uh, you know, transform your mind and uh, your heart can be transformed, that there's a strong link between our heads and our hearts. And if one gets changed, the other can be changed as well. So I just want to underscore the availability of, of those three programs to the community. Yeah. Well, so, uh, um, you know, I was thinking about, Jack, uh, I don't know if this would work for the first question about what white people can say to other white people who, to begin a conversation. But, you know, if we, if we look at racism as an illness in the human family, you know, kind of like COVID-19, if, if no one, if you can't convince a person to wear a mask, what, you know, what can you do? But racism is, has that same uh, effect on, on the community. And so um, if, if you you know, even though, you know, we, sometimes people say, well, you know, my parents, my grandparents didn't own slaves. And so, I, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with it. I can stay in my bubble. But one of the, the phrases that we use a lot is that um, it, we didn't build the house, but we live in it. So, you know, if you buy a, an, an old house and the furnace doesn't work, you can say, well, you know, I don't have to fix it. Well, I mean, duh, <laughs> you know. Thanks very much. Ricky, thank you. Hey everybody, I know we're all muted, but as has become our habit, could we thank uh, Vicki tonight by just showing our hands clapping in the screen? <laughs> Vicki, it was so good. Thank you so very much. We're so glad you're part of the Just Faith Ministries Network. We're so grateful for all your contributions to the programs that we're offering around the country, and it's just been such a gift tonight. So thank you everybody for being here. I'd like to close with a prayer. Good and gracious God, who loves and delights in all people, we stand in awe before you, knowing that the spark of life within each person on earth is the spark of your divine life. Differences among cultures and countries and ethnic groups are multicolored manifestations of your light. May our hearts and minds be open to celebrate similarities and differences among our sisters and brothers. We place our hopes for racial harmony in our committed action and in your presence in our neighbor 
May all peoples live in peace. Amen. And good night, everybody. <laughs>